Welcome to the third and final of the Van Horn Lecture, Distinguished Lectures for 2017. What motivates scientific research? Sometimes it's uh, just a desire to understand basic questions about how the world works, to improve our fund one, fundamental understanding of the physical world. And sometimes it's to address a conspicuous need in society uh, or to improve on an existing way that that need is currently being met. And there are certainly other motivations as well. Uh, Professor Xu put his first lecture in the context of that second motivation, uh, addressing a need for making a very useful material in a way that was uh, uh, less hazardous to the environment and to human health. And uh, then in his second lecture, he showed that no matter uh, what motivates the scientific research, good science just does more than just answer the original question or address the original need. And he devoted his second lecture to showing how a similar approach could be applied in different areas, to different materials, or to different processing routes. And so that's the way that good science points the way to solutions to other demands, better solutions to other problems. And still, good science all by itself, even coming up with the best solution to the, to the problem you wanted to address, is not enough if it cannot have the impact brought about by being able to manufacture that solution. Uh, a mentor of mine told me that no matter how good your science, no, no matter how pressing the problem it is that you think you solve, you will have no impact unless you can amplify the, uh, the availability of that solution through on an industrial scale in the context of engineering through manufacturing. And so not only is manufacturing and material scale up the theme of Professor Shu's third lecture, He's also rooted it back into one of the most fundamental of all sciences, thermodynamics. Uh, and I'm sure somewhere J. Willard Gibbs is very pleased to see where his work has been taken. And uh, I'm looking forward very much to hearing your third lecture. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, you've done an excellent job recapitulating what I did the past two days, but I'll go ahead and recapitulate it again anyway, why not? Um, so I'd like to start again the way I did yesterday. I just kind of want to know if you have seen what I talked about the past two days or not. So do me a favor, I want to see a show of hands, and in fact, a show of fingers. So a one if you saw one of my last two lectures, and a two if you saw two of my last two lectures, please. Peace. <laughs> awesome. All right. So good. So a lot of people have seen one, and many of you have seen two. Uh, so what I promised you on the first day, and what I've been building toward and, and um, working through here, is essentially a chronological story that started at MIT 15 years ago, and which I keep working on to this day. Um, on, in my first lecture, I put forward a thermodynamic premise, which I'm going to hit on again today. And then I wanted to show you how that theme, I can riff on that theme and I can broaden that theme. And yesterday we broadened it dramatically. Yesterday was really about engineering and design and sort of trying to be creative with that concept. And what I want to do today is actually bring it back to the lab. And instead of going broad, what I want to do is go deep. I want to come to the idea of what can thermodynamics do for us to really open up the window for processing nanostructured materials in a bigger way than just electroplating, which we've done in the past two days. So I'll start by sort of, again, recapitulating what I hope you took away, right? So this is, you know, if there's a, just like one or two things that you took away, th this is what I hope th uh, those are. So first of all, nanocrystalline metals, materials that have an internal length scale or a grain size on the order of a, a few dozen nanometers are strong, they're hard, and as a result, they are useful. And you may remember all the different things we could use them for, from structural lightweighting components to electronic coatings to uh, green alternative coatings for unsexy components, as I like to say. So hopefully you remember that. I hope you also remember the fundamental challenge that those materials intrinsically, thermodynamically, are, th are unstable, right? So if you make a nanocrystalline pure metal, like nickel or, or any pure metal, really, 
you can expect the grains to coarsen and you can expect them to coarsen very rapidly, even at room temperature, but certainly if you heat them up a little bit. Alloying, in my opinion, is really the key to the future in nanostructured materials because alloying is a way to chemically provide stability. And so we've talked about my work where I focused on the use of tungsten to stabilize the structure of nanocrystal and nickel and much higher temperatures and longer times and so on, we can have stable nanostructures. And I hope you'll remember that in part, at least, that stability is because of thermodynamics. So whereas the conventional driving force for grain growth is this monotonic energy landscape that favors the elimination of grain boundaries, when you do alloying and when you decorate the grain boundaries with alloying elements, you change fundamentally the shape of this energy landscape. You do what J. Willard Gibbs taught us in the world of surfactancy over 100 years ago, you add a term related to segregation, and that term in red is exactly opposite to the grain growth trend, which allows you then to make things that have, in essence, formal stability. And in your mind, in your mind's eye, when you think of a stable nanostructured material, I want you to think of this Monte Carlo simulation that shows something like a stone wall. This is the way I like to think about it. A stable nanocrystalline material is a, a stone wall where the mortar amongst the stones is a solute element that you have intentionally picked to stabilize those grain boundaries. Now, of course, um, we can apply this to many different materials. Thermodynamics is general. And so you, I hope you'll remember that you can play this trick again and again and again. And you can play it from one application to the next and one material to the next. And you can even mix and match grain sizes in new ways if you're doing it well. And I hope you remember these things. But I'm a professor, I've been a professor for 15 years, and I know just how low the sticking coefficient is when I give a lecture. So I know that the only thing you really remember is that I have a dog named Gibbs, and that I have two daughters that are not named Polly and Crystal. Uh, my pointer is dying. Does anyone have another pointer? No? All right. Yeah, it's kind of coming in and out. All right. So. That's kind of what I've done in the past two days. And I've had to cover a lot of territory, and I've had to do it fast. And so I've been not entirely upfront about all the details and all the facts. And so at this point, I want to bring out some of the baggage, all right? I want to talk about all the unanswered questions, which, by the way, I'm having a lot of fun here because you guys are engaged, and you're asking exactly the right questions. And so a lot of what I want to talk about today, you've already hit upon it in question and answer session. What I want to do is talk about all the things that I sort of shoved under the hood. First of all, I've been telling you that this is a platform and we can do lots of different processing technologies. Um, but actually, I only did one, right? I like, hey, look over there. We can do lots of processing. But all I did was electroplating, all right? So clearly, I have to address that today. If we want this to be more broadly useful, we've got to apply this to other platforms. Secondly, um, I'm talking about stability. And I keep telling you how stable these things are. And I've kind of brushed under the rug you know, that all the tests that I've done of stability are pretty modest, right? So for example, when I talked about nanocrystalline silver, or I talked about you know, heating it to 250 degrees for a day, or I talked about 30, 30 whopping minutes at 500 degrees C. Like, this is not really a test of thermal stability. It's a test of uh, practical stability, as Gibbs would have said, right? So this is kind of a nice start. But I have also studiously avoided the deeper question of how stable are we. So that, that's something I'd like to shore up. And I, I have a confession to make that um, I, although there is a dog, there was a dog named Gibbs. I did have this dog. I sort of misled you. He's, he's no longer with us. So uh, I had Gibbs for the first 13 years of this project, and then, and then he died. So um, we're going to have to work on that today as well. So. <laughs> no, no, he lived a, good, a long, happy life for a poodle. 13 years, not bad. Um, I, miss him, I miss him dearly. But um, So anyway, what I want to do today is go through this checklist. I want to dig in deeper on these points and uh, address those things. So I'm going to start by talking about other ways that we might make nanocrystalline metals. And I want to see if they are commensurate with my approach of alloying to stabilize them. Now, when I started, I, you know, I, I talk about this energy landscape here, which we attribute to J. Willard Gibbs. And the very first thing I did was introduce a processing method that is sort of a non-equilibrium processing method, which allows me to trick the system and make things that have very fine grains. 
So you use an out of equilibrium processing method like electrodeposition or, in fact, vacuum phase, vapor phase deposition. These methods are very good at making fine grained materials and they do that because they are not equilibrium processes. In some sense, you start from a, a highly energetic state, highly entropic state, and you quench, right? So quenching out of vapor, of course, is into solid. You can store a lot of excess energy, and so you can land, you know, you're up in the ether here, and then you just sort of land on the side of this, this curve. And here you're doing it out of solution to a solid. But these are non-equilibrium processes that we can trick to put things on the, on the side of the hill here. The other way that one could approach the steep part of this hill, in fact, this is probably where a metallurgist should start. So I'm telling you, so you're a metallurgist and you've got an energy hill that you want to walk up, how do you do it? I think a good metallurgist, every good metallurgist would probably start by saying you beat on it, right? So strap on your loincloth, go in the lab and add that energy mechanically. And in fact, uh, for the past 30 years, I want to acknowledge that you know, lots of people have actually worked on this problem. And I, I don't want to pretend that I invented this, the, the idea that we want to make nanostructured materials. Um, this review is now over 10 years old, but um, Valiev and many other people like him have done very creative things to, without changing the shape of a material in a, in a macroscopic sense, to store a lot of mechanical energy. For example, extruding a billet around a corner, extruding it through a twist, uh, applying pressure well, applying shear to a material. You can preserve the shape of the material and you can store a ton of mechanical energy. Um, ball milling of powders, another variation on that theme. And these are all conceptually similar and they all kind of look like this on the inside. If I take a billet of material and I extrude it around a corner, I start by accumulating dislocation content. And if you do that, not once, not twice, but four, eight, 12, and 16 times, gradually those dislocations assemble themselves and they become legitimate high angle grain boundaries and you can get very fine grain structures by mechanically beating your way up that hill. So here's an interesting idea then. There's a lot of work. There's tens of thousands of papers on ways to make nanostructured metals with classical metallurgical mechanical work. So here's my idea. What I want to do is maybe I'll beat my way up this curve, but if I do this in the right alloy, maybe I can lock it in, right? So if I start with something down here, I'm going to mechanically go up here and then I'm going to try to lock in using alloying. So why don't we talk about that? Well, as long as we're at it and we're trying to do something uh, with a new processing method, let's go ahead and try to pick something that we hope someday might scale up and be a technology, right? If you do calculations on the energetics of these mechanical processes, you'll find very quickly that these have a challenging scaling proposition for anything but small pieces and sort of niche applications. So although these are definitely very successful, the scaling proposition I find a little bit challenging. On the other hand, ball milling. This is an eminently scalable technology. So you can, if you can do ball milling in the lab at the scale of grams, you can get to tonnage quantities in a pilot facility quite easily, you can produce a lot of material that has been beaten to death by the action of balls in a high energy ball mill. So I kind of like this. I kind of like this as a potential scaling pathway. So here's sort of the vision. I'm going to start with a little vision. Then we're going to get back to thermo. I envision that maybe I'm going to make a bunch of powder, which is micro powder, but which is nanocrystalline. I will shape it into a green body and center it in the classical ways that the powder metallurgy industry does, right? It's a big industry. Um, they've been doing this for a very long time, $30 billion a year, big industry, right? If we can do this right, we can drop into that industry and the scaling is, is really quite impressive. If we uh, talk about things like hipping and uh, 3D printing and additive, you can make large parts, things that are big and heavy and weigh you know, kilograms to tons. On the other hand, if we do press and center or MIM, metal injection molding, we can actually make millions of components, right? Um, so we can get high volumes and large monoliths, complicated shapes, interesting high value add componentry. What I'd like to do is marry that with the idea of a stable nanocrystalline material. What I want to do is take this powder and now make it nanocrystalline internally and then process it into shapes using this approach. So that's the concept. So you can do it. It is, it is in principle doable. Like I said, I can make powder that is micron scale powder, but internally nanocrystalline. Now, if you're going to do that, 
and you want to go and inject yourself into an existing powder metallurgy market, where would you start? Well, what I decided was there's one corner of the powder metallurgy world where they will adopt readily because everything made out of this material is made through a powder route, and it is our friend tungsten, right? So tungsten is not a metal that one goes around melting very much with a melting point at 3,600 Celsius. It is routine to process it through powder root. And so this is an industry comfortable with the scales I'm talking about. And it is known, in fact, that if you ball mill tungsten powder, you can make beautiful powder that has very fine nanocrystalline grain sizes in it. That's been known for many decades. Now, of course, the problem is, so we've got a large market. We've got a potential um, approach to the powder. But of course, if we're going to do powder metallurgy, now stability becomes the key. Right? Because if I take this powder and I make a green body and I'm going to sinter it, that means I've got to heat it up hot. For example, an entry level temperature for the sintering or consolidation of tungsten is of order 1100 Celsius. Right? 1100 Celsius. If you heat up that hot, we're now talking red heat, we really do need stability of the grain structure because nanocrystalline tungsten has an explosion of grain size at that temperature um, over a matter of hours. This happens to be a week. My scale bar is bigger by a factor of four, and the grains are bigger by a factor of 10. And this is order of magnitude kind of explosion in grain size. So this is my idea. I'm going to take this stuff that's known, and I'm going to work on that stability problem. And now we have a specific challenge. I want to be stable enough that I can heat up to red heat and retain a nanostructure so that I can survive a consolidation cycle. While I'm at it, I may want to work on the sintering temperature because another way to lick this problem is to sort of lower the processing temperature. So we'll come back to that. All right, back to my uh, concept of surfactancy for grain boundaries. Again, not my concept. This is uh, Jay Willard Gibbs's concept. But again, the question is, what are we going to put in there that will make something very, very stable so that we can heat it to red heat? And again, the schematic that I'm looking for is this. If you were here the past two days, I talked about how you can go from schematic to something a little bit more predictive. And so I talked to you about using a regular solution model. If you calibrate a, a regular solution model, you can, in fact, make these analytical, and you can draw free energy curves, and you can calculate minimum grain sizes under the assumption that it is a regular solution. Not always a good assumption. If you don't like that assumption, you can do Lattice Monte Carlo, I talked about that yesterday. This now becomes quite quantitative and, in fact, numerical uh, when you do Lattice Monte Carlo. And you can map out these surfaces and identify equilibrium grain sizes for non-regular solutions. And again, you're looking for the stone wall structure. If you are under full, if the grain size is too small, you're not fully saturated. And if you are over full, then the grains contain solute that they don't want to contain, and so the equilibrium structure is the stone wall perfectly decorated with mortar. All right. So now it's time for my con confession about stability. This conception of stability compares only changes in grain size. When I heat up really hot, atoms can move around and do lots of stuff besides change grain size. And so what I've been doing this whole time is I'm talking to you about this particular space where I'm changing grain size and I'm allowing things to segregate and change the concentration on the boundary. And I'm looking for free energy surfaces that have a minimum at a finite grain size. And what I've been kind of hinting at is that all I really want is a system that has a minimum here. And what I don't want is a system where that minimum is trivially out at infinity. So I've been comparing and just looking for things where there is a minimum. And that's all I've been talking about. And a lot of you have figured out the deficiency in that. There's actually a lot more to stability than grain size. So now it's confession time. Okay? So here is nickel tungsten. I electroplate nickel tungsten. And it is beautiful, solid solution. The grain boundaries are decorated. Um, if I do a diffraction pattern and I just look at the, the first ring here, this is the integrated intensity uh, as you change the Bragg angle on this, uh, on this uh, diffraction pattern here. I've got you know, solid solution, 1, 1, 1 peak, beautiful material. Now I'm going to start heating it up. And let's look at where does stability break down and how does it break down. So first of all, I'm going to heat it to 300 degrees for a day. And this is the TEM image. It didn't change. You see nothing. You see nothing here. You see nothing here. No change. Stable-ish. 
Now let's heat it up to 600 degrees. Again, no change over here, no change in grain size, not measurable with the techniques that we're using. But if you look at the diffraction pattern and you just squint really hard, what you'll see is that there's a little hump here. And this hump is associated with the development of short range order in the FCC nickel lattice. So this is a known thing in the nickel tungsten system. You get a one, one half, zero incipient reflection for short range ordering. And then if I heat just a little bit more, 700 degrees for a day, you watch that incipient short range peak split up into legitimate diffraction peaks associated with the inner metallic phase that pops out. And now the grain size explodes. So the way I see stability in this system is you're heating it up, it's very, very stable, but when the atoms have enough mobility to start to order and form an intermetallic, now you form intermetallics and you scavenge the tungsten off the grain boundaries, and now the grains are undecorated and they can grow. I'm not the only one to see this. In fact, people kind of started to notice this uh, back in 2000 in another system that has grain boundary segregation, nickel phosphorus, which I had a wonderful conversation about uh, this afternoon with the Ernst Group. In this system, it's the same exact story. When you deposit nickel uh, with phosphorus in it, here's the, the primary peak. As you heat it up to 250, 400, 425, the peak doesn't change at all, so the grain size is not changing at all. You start to see narrowing of that peak, and therefore grain growth, at the same moment where you see the second phase start to pop out. So grain growth is not the instability that we need to worry about. It's the second phases popping out and competing. And once that happens, you've ripped apart my entire platform, right? It's all apart. So this is the proposition. This is what we need to think about. Back to thermodynamics 101. I, I'm talking about this, and I'm calculating, and I'm trying to find systems that have this. What I really need to do now is compare that against bulk thermodynamics, where the free energy curve may have a two-phase field or an intermetallic in it. I need to compare this and this in order to really address the problem of global stability. And so here is what I'm going to do. I've got bulk thermodynamics for my alloy. Here's the free energy curve for a simple you know, symmetrical system. For that system, I'm going to do my kind of thermodynamics. I'm going to calculate and find where the nanocrystalline phases are. And I'm going to seek systems where that nanocrystalline structure is actually a lower energy state <coughs> than anything on the bulk phase diagram. So that's sort of, I'm hoping I can find those things. So let's do it. I'll show you what this looks like for a regular solution model, and then I'm going to assert that it's kind of the same if I go away from regular solutions. So here's what you do. There are really two critical thermodynamic parameters in the system. There's, for example, the heat of mixing in the bulk, right? This is the thing, this is your bulk thermodynamics. And for the moment, I'm just going to make all these numbers positive. I'll talk about positive heat of mixing systems, where what I'm worried about is phase separation uh, following this common tangent here. And on this axis, I'm going to put the grain boundary thermodynamics. So this is the enthalpy of segregation to the grain boundaries. So this is bulk. This is grain boundary. What I really want is for this thing to dominate over this thing. And that, what you can do is you can go through with your thermodynamic models. And for a given point, this point would be one alloy. It's an alloy that has this heat of mixing and this grain boundary segregation. And I can calculate whether it's stable, unstable, or metastable. So this one happens to be unstable. I'll call it red. I can do it again over here and over here. This thing turns out to be metastable. This thing turns out to be stable. And if you just populate the whole space, you come up with the, in hindsight, not surprising result that if you want grain boundaries to be stable, you want the segregation energy to be high. So the upper left-hand corner is the useful space. These guys can potentially be more stable than anything on the bulk phase diagram. And so here's basically the premise. I don't just, I don't just want grain boundary segregation. I don't just want a high value of this. I need this to be high relative to the bulk things that are happening. This diagram is for positive heats of mixing. If you want to do it more thoroughly, you have to include compound formation, intermetallics, negative heats of mixing. And so I'm going to do a, a variable swap on you here. Here it is. I now have not only the heat of mixing, but the energies of compounds that it form in the system. And now you see a very simple result. I want grain boundary segregation. If I don't have enough, I'm always going to be unstable. And bulk thermodynamics are going to happen. If I have enough, if I get above 20 kilojoules per mole, typically, then 
I may be stable or I may be metastable to the formation of those phases. So here's your mental picture. I'm almost done with the math. Nickel tungsten, nickel phosphorus, aluminum manganese, all the stuff I've showed you to this point, I think it falls in this region right here. The grain boundaries want to be segregated, but in truth, it's metastable to the formation of the bulk phases. So I start, and I'm lucky. Electrodeposition is lucky. It produces this brick wall structure, and it's, it's metastable, but it is not formally stable. So that when I heat it, it can do this. It can pop out those bulk phases, it can desegregate those boundaries, and it can inflate the length scale of the system. So that, I think, everything I've told you, you know, sorry, it's not as stable as I would like it to be. What I want is something that's up here. And what's up here is weird, okay? So here, thought experiment. This is counterintuitive. It's, even to me, even though I think about this every day, I find this counterintuitive. Here's the thought experiment. I'm going to start with a single crystal. And I'm going to do a Monte Carlo experiment here. This single crystal, I'm going to assign it an energy state of zero. Now, I'm going to do two things to this single crystal. First, I'm going to alloy it with something. And I'm going to alloy it with something that has a positive heat of mixing, so a kilojoule per mole. So I'm adding something, and it costs energy. So the energy is going up, and I'm dissolving it. And in fact, I've put in too much here. It's already starting to form a second phase, so I'm at the solubility limit. That's an energy-raising proposition. All right, now, let's think about that single crystal. Let's do another energy-raising thing. Let's turn that into a polycrystal. That also costs energy. And if I use the same amount of energy, a kilojoule per mole, I'll get a nano grain size. So that's about a 10 nanometer grain size. So here are two things, and they both cost me energy. But if I put those two things together at the same time, and I make this brick wall structure, it's profoundly energy lowering. So this is counterintuitive. In bulk thermodynamics, you think of these things as being somehow superimposable, but they're not. Grain boundary states have their own energetics. They're independent of the bulk. And so this is why these systems pop out as being energetically favorable. Crazy, right? All right. So, it's, so basically, when you put the grain boundaries in, the material is starved for the sunlight element in the system. Correct. What he just said is the grain boundaries, you put those in, and they're high energy. And they're starved for that alloying element that didn't want to go in the bulk in the first place because it cost energy. When you put it on the boundary, now energy lowering for the whole system. So that's the idea. It's a tantalizing idea. Can it be realized in practice? I hope so. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about tungsten. Let's go try to put this into practice, OK? So here is another one of these maps. This is based on Monte Carlo. So this is, this is not regular solution. This is actually non-regular solutions. And what I've done here is I've taken every element for which we have thermodynamic data with tungsten that is a positive heat of mixing. So these are all the positive heat of mixing systems with tungsten. None of these guys want to mix into tungsten. Okay, And I can populate it. And now I can say, well, which one of these is an alloy that I should go in the lab and try? And I talked to you yesterday about how I do that selection process. So I'm going to throw out things that are not sustainable or cost effective. So for example, I'm not going to use gold or scandium. I'm not going to use thorium because that's scary, right? There's a lot of stuff you can cross off on here for, for sort of practical reasons. And on top of that, I'm now not going to use things that are going to be bulk stable, and I'm going to use things that are preferentially in the upper left-hand quadrant. Now, here's sort of the ironic thing. If you're just basing this only on grain boundary segregation, you'd kind of think you want the highest possible value. You want the most grain boundary segregation. So you might pick these higher ones, but ironically, what you really want is to be as far away from the line as possible. And so it turns out that titanium, it's the lowest one on here. It's actually the lowest grain boundary segregating thing in the entire deck, but it's one of the preferred options because it's high above the line. So let's try titanium. Here's the tungsten titanium phase diagram. It's a miscibility gap, positive heat of mixing, as promised. If I'm going to make a tungsten alloy and I'm going to put in, say, I don't know, 10 or 20% titanium, I'm going to be right here. And I'm going to operate at a high temperature where I hope to center, say 1,100. So I'm going to be right here on this phase diagram. It's a solid solution field. Okay. So here's the simulation. If I turn off the grain boundaries and I simulate this alloy, here's what it looks like. Sure enough, it's a solid solution. right? That's the bulk thermodynamic approach. 
But now, when I incorporate the, the possibility of grain boundaries, look at what the simulation spits out. This is a lower energy configuration than anything on the bulk phase diagram. And it is a nanostructured material where the degeneracy of the grain boundaries is incredibly high. So the grain boundaries sort of thicken up. And you have grain boundaries that I guess you might want to call them amorphous even. Like the amorphous state is somehow popping out. Thick grain boundaries surrounding pockets of tungsten rich nano grains is what the simulation tells us to look for. Crazy. All right, let's go in the lab. I had a really great student, Tong Jai. Tong Jai did this work. She went into the lab and she did what I showed you. She started with nanocrystalline tungsten. She reproduced what people had done for decades. And you know, I showed you here what this looks like visually. Here are the results showing that if you don't dope up the tungsten, you get grain growth in the period of one week at 1100 C. What Tong Jai did is she said, look, one week at 1100 C, that's a lot of time. Let's calculate kinetically how much motion of the atoms there will be. And so she did a bunch of diffusion calculations for diffusion on the defects, on the grain boundaries, on the triple junctions, in the volume, inner diffusion, if I put titanium in. If I heat something up that hot, how much can the atoms move around? And the answer is tungsten can move around maybe on the order of 10 microns. And titanium can move around on the order of 100 microns. It's a light element. So that's a long time. Atoms can move all over the place and do whatever they want. And so if I start with something that's milled and nanocrystalline, in principle, there's a lot of scope for this thing to restructure itself, which makes it remarkable when it doesn't. So after a week at 1100 C at red heat, the grain size coming out is to first order a dead on match for what went in. Very, very stable. Why is it stable? Well, hopefully it's for the reason that I've been asserting. Hopefully it's because I'm making a titanium rich grain boundary region that is stabilizing the nanostructure. So the simulations tell me to look for this. Let's go in the lab and look for it. Tong Jai was not happy to have to go look for this because doing electron microscopy on tungsten is very hard and doing atom probe tomography on tungsten is even harder yet. But she did it because I told her to fix it. Right? So Tong Jai starts with this simulation. She goes in the lab. She did some STEM EDS mapping and this is the structure that she saw. And if I take that and I put it on the same scale bar as this. Here is the kind of concentration profiles we're talking about in that sample. And that's not bad. And then she took atom probe data. And if I put that on the same scale, she sees that. So uh, Chris, how does this uh, play along with the theory of Ostler drive? Have interface energy there? Well, if the interface energy, if the interface energy is zero, that's how it connects. So in principle, if you do an excess energy calculation on these grain boundaries properly decorated, they have an interface energy, excess energy of zero, which means that they don't want to coarsen. So these profiles are remarkably consistent with one another. It's all kind of hanging together. And the thing that I want to emphasize here again is that the bulk phase diagram would just have this thing fully dissolve. It would be a solid solution. So the fact that after heating, you see something that is so wildly distributed when it need not be, that's the remarkable and interesting thing. The stability is also useful. So alloying can, in fact, stabilize things. And I really think all the evidence suggests that thermodynamics has a huge part in stabilizing nanostructure. Um, so I think I can check that off, putting a check there. And I'm done boring you with mathematics. Uh, let's go ahead and address the dog. So Gibbs, I lost the dog. I was very upset. Um, and as you know, I got to name the dog. I did not get to name the girls. But now, about six months ago, we got a new dog. And we decided to let the girls name the dog. And I just want to share with you like my moment of greatest fatherly joy when my children named this dog Pie. <laughs> So I just want you to know that the nerd baton has been successfully passed in this household at least. So I now have a dog named Pi. <clears throat> All right, so I'm glad we addressed that. Um, so let's go back to processing. All right, so so far this is feeling like a success story. We've done a little bit better theory. We've got some nuance on how to make things stable against second phases popping out. 
this is not quite yet a manufacturing technology because I still have to take that powder and I got to center it into parts, right? So let's talk about this. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll take my powder with titanium in it and I'm going to press and center it, okay? So I take the powder and I press it. And I had a new student for this, Mansu. Mansu uh, spent four years trying to figure out how am I going to densify this stuff. So what you do is you press it. If you cold press, you'll get a relative density of order 60, 65%, depending on how you do it. And now I'm going to heat this thing up. And this is just an example experiment. So I'm going to heat up over like five hours. And this alloy is going to do nothing, a whole lot of nothing. And in fact, I think that sort of makes sense because I've picked a system where it's going to assemble a nanostructure and then stick there, right? It doesn't want to move around. Even though it can move around, it doesn't want to move around. And so sintering onsets very, very slowly. And in fact, we designed it to be stable at 1100. Even at much higher temperatures, it's not really starting to sinter. Now, you can sort of hot press it, and you can play tricks, and you can play games. But, but this is really a challenging system to consolidate and retain the fine grain size. So things in green don't want to move around. I'm making a configuration where they sort of lock down thermodynamically. What if I migrate over here into blue? In the blue, it's labeled here duplex nanostructures. If I uh, shift my attention to chromium, it says duplex. Before, I called it metastable. Let me show you what I mean by this metastable. So this is the tungsten chromium binary phase diagram. So right here, this is my Monte Carlo simulation. This is a phase diagram, temperature versus composition. So it's a pictorial phase diagram. And if I turn off the grain boundaries, you see here classical miscibility gap, right? So this is the solubility limit right here. If I go past the solubility limit, I pop out chromium. That's the bulk phase diagram. Here's what one of these metastable systems looks like if I now turn on the grain boundaries and run it again. It is still a system where the chromium wants to pop out. So there is still a solubility limit here. And when I go beyond it, it pops out the chromium. But the first activated state for chromium, if it's not dissolved, if, it, if it's not in its own phase, the first activated state is not to dissolve into the bulk. It is to decorate the grain boundaries. So I have here a system where it wants a second phase, but it also wants to decorate grain boundaries. What happens is, if you look closely here, the solubility limit is shifted over. So I'm moving the solubility limit because I'm allowed to precipitate some out and have some on the grain boundaries. And look what happens as I heat up. As these things dissolve, they dissolve preferentially and decorate the grain boundaries. So I can have stability and second phases at the same time. That's interesting. Because now I can send Mansu to the lab and say, all right, now we have a system where we can pop out second phases, and those might be highly diffusive. And in fact, chromium, it's a lower melting temperature than tungsten. That stuff is going to be very, very mobile. So here's what we'll do. We'll start by milling this powder, and it starts as a total solid solution, right? So it's completely dissolved. Now, when we heat it up, from the as-milled configuration, as we warm it up, and as chromium starts to move around, we're going to hope that it decorates grain boundaries and starts to pop out as a second phase. And in this x-ray diffraction data, you can watch the primary peak. When you get to about 850, you start to eject chromium out of the tungsten lattice, and you form a second phase. And in fact, here's the TEM micrograph. And these little guys, all these little grains that you see here, are chromium, little chromium-rich grains that are popping out, just like we see over here. In fact, the agreement is, is pleasant. Um, the, the simulated structures and the ones we see when we heat these up look very similar. If I keep heating up, I should dissolve the second phase, and I should see grain boundary segregation. So if I heat it up a little hotter, go to 1400, I get a slightly coarser structure. I've dissolved the second phase. And if I go in and I mill across individual grain boundaries, sure enough, I can actually measure chromium segregation at those grain boundaries when I heat it up that hot. So I hope you're with me here. This is getting complicated. But here's what happens. I start with tungsten and chromium. It's a system that wants to phase separate and be nanocrystalline at the same time. Now, as I heat it up from room temperature, and I heat it up like during a sintering cycle, what's going to happen is I get to about 800 or 850, and I start to eject chromium from the solid solution. I start to form the second phases. And look what happens to the sintering curve. So I'm now going to show you the sintering curve starting from a cold press density here. I'm heating, I'm heating, I'm heating. Bam. 
when the second phase pops out a solution, this thing consolidates like crazy. It just centers up into a full density bulk very, very quickly. This is a 95% density without even really trying. And the reason it happens is that this second phase is lubricating sintering. So look at this. You freeze this on various points along the way. As you heat up, the second phase chromium that pops out, it goes to the necks between the particles, and it ends up being a lubricant for sintering. So to recapitulate, nanocrystalline starts with chromium dissolved. I heat it up. Chromium pops out everywhere inside the particles, but it pops out preferentially at the necks. And so here's my mental picture of what it looks like. It starts dissolved. When I heat it up, I get this duplex structure. I get lubricated necks that rapidly center. And sure enough, I can center now to full density, and I can get really fine grain sizes. Now, if you're a sintering person, and you do tungsten in particular, there are ways to make tungsten sinter fast. Um, you can do liquid phase sintering. So you'll put in iron and nickel and things that melt uh, copper. You, you can melt phases, and that will rapidly sinter. But you'll have very large grains, you know, 80 microns. You can do what they call activated sintering. So you can put in something like nickel into tungsten, and you get a change in the grain boundary structure. And you do get rapid sintering, but you also get rapid coarsening. And so here you get grains that are up to 10 microns in size. What we're doing is similar to that, but the fact that it's all done at the nanoscale makes it remarkably fast. Nothing melts. Uh, it's not activated sintering. We call it nanophase separation sintering. And we get to very high densities with grain sizes that are in the submicron range. All right, so submicron range is desirable. I really wanted nano. My whole talk is about nano. My whole three days are about nano. Can I get nano? How do I get finer grains yet? Well, titanium gave me the really fine grains, 10 nanometers. Chromium gave me rapid sintering. Maybe I can put them together. Maybe we can do ternary. You can do ternary. In fact, titanium and chromium turn out to have almost mutually exclusive effects. If I put in titanium, the simulations show me in this ternary diagram that that will make my grain size small, and I'll get my stone wall structure. If I add chromium, I get second phases popping out. If I do both that and that at the same time, I get this kind of structure. The Monte Carlo shows you what the ternary system will look like. I'm going to get the second phases, and I'm going to get the, the stone wall structure simultaneously. And sure enough, Titanium alone does not consolidate, but once I do both together, I can actually get rapid sintering, and I can make parts free sintering, no applied pressure, that pop out full density and 100 nanometer grain size. So electroplating, everything I did with electroplating was really thin. Now I got something big enough, almost big enough to hurt myself with. And that, that's, a, that's a good moment for a metallurgist. And it works. So Mansu fought and fought to get this, this data point here. It's, it's a star. Stars are better than circles. <laughs> so Mansu had to get this star. And Mansu tried a lot of different recipes. There's some empiricism here, right? We can't calculate everything. But Mansu fought to get this star, which was the 100 nanometer grain size in a bulk component. And it was this ternary uh, system here. So I'm excited by this. There's a lot of promise here, because now We've learned something about stability. We've put it into practice. We're able to make large parts. And my premise all along was, look, if I can do this in the lab at the grand scale, and I can press it, and I can make a part this big at MIT, you know, maybe I can scale that up and make big parts. So what parts would you make? Well, in the world of tungsten powder metallurgy, one of the obvious things to work on is materials for cutting and penetration and machining. And this is where we use tungsten carbide. Right? So if you want to make cutting materials, what you really want is you want it to be very, very strong, very, very hard. So you want ceramic-like strength. But you also want it to be tough. You want metal-like toughness. And so if you favor the toughness, you end up with high-strength steels. If you favor the hardness, you end up with things like you know, carbides. And the way we address a compromise on these properties is to mix them together. Right? So uh, cemented carbides are the dominant technology because they sort of move up and to the right on this diagram. Well, what if I just take a metal? It's all metal. It's tungsten with chromium and titanium. There's nothing but metal there. It's all metallic bonding. So it's going to be, you know, in principle, it'll, it can have metal-like toughness. And we can make it now very, very hard because it's nanostructured. Well, you can do. And it, it turns out to work. Um, so 
I'm going to show you now, these are field data. So the Army made penetrators out of this material for us. And it, when you want to penetrate something, this is used for cutting concrete. All right? So imagine that you're cutting concrete or penetrating concrete. What you really want to do in order to cut into concrete, you want to deliver a lot of energy to the, to the thing. So you want to move really fast. right? So if you're the Army, you're probably shooting really fast. right? But, um, so you want to go as fast as possible without fracturing. And you want a lot of momentum behind you. So you want high density. And so the contours of performance run toward the upper right here. So you really want to move to the upper right. And of course, you can go to the lower density, and you can use steel. And you can shoot it yay fast before it starts to deform and not work. You can go to carbides, which are more dense. And you can shoot them faster before they start to fracture. And with our materials that are all metallically bonded, the first generation material is an equivalent with tungsten carbide. So straight out of the MIT lab, right off the, off the bat, we're a little more dense and we're at the same velocity. And the second generation material, this is, this is a projected point. This is real data. This is a projection. But we're optimistic that with some engineering, we'll be able to outperform what, what we do today for cutting of concrete. So I'm hopeful that tools and machining and this kind of stuff is a possible early application. So, this company here, Veloxent, is my commercialization partner for this project. And whereas at MIT, we work on the scale of grams, these guys are now making 100 kilogram batches of powder. And at MIT, we just did uniaxial pressing and we made cheesy little cylinders. These guys are using every green body forming process known to humankind. We do not only pressing, we do isostatic pressing, we're doing metal injection molding, and we're even doing green body 3D printing of various types. So you can make now very interesting shapes and heat them up. And in fact, you can make large blocks of material, decidedly big enough to hurt myself now. And you can make intricate part shapes and so on. And all of these are made out of nanocrystalline tungsten. So these are bulk nanocrystalline alloys stabilized through the processing cycle. All right, you've made it. You've made it through three days of thermodynamics. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people who contributed to this work. Uh, you met my students, Tong Jai and Mansu. There are others here, Heather and Zach, who contributed. This is the team at Veloxent that is working on the scale up and the army that helped us with those tests. What I would like to conclude with is an overarching view of what I've tried to do in the past three days. Stabilization of nanocrystalline structures, I think, could be very useful for a lot of materials and a lot of things. And hopefully, what you took away from me in the past few days is that it is a thermodynamic problem. And in fact, it's a frontier area for thermodynamics to understand how grain boundaries interact with bulk thermodynamics and how can we design things that have interfaces thermodynamically part of the structure. So there's a lot of room for thermodynamic theory. There's a lot of room for work on specific new systems. And then mapping those, of course, to different processing methods. These are but two ways to try to make these. I hope in the future there will be many more, but it will need help from people like you to, to work on those things. And of course, at the end of the day, we all have an engineering hat that we wear if we're in a school of engineering. And so you need to be thinking about the various places that you can plug it in and look for a performance advantage and try to help the world. And I hope I've showed you just a few of those as well. With that, I would like to conclude, and I would like to thank all of you. So I want to say that the hospitality that I've received here has been absolutely tremendous. I feel like I've been treated like a king, uh, and, and I'm, I'm getting fat <laughs> from how well I've been fed. And I, at, my brain is full from having so many enlightening discussions with all of you. I have, I've had a wonderful time, and I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity, and thank you for listening. Very fascinating talk, again. Um, I wanted to ask you if the segregants feel so happy in these grain boundaries, loosely speaking, why is, does it not happen that they actually extend the grain boundary area? Do you ever see in your simulations that grain boundaries become more wavy or fractal? 
We had a brief discussion about this yesterday. That is exactly what is needed. So if you go to the overfull condition and then somehow anneal, and the system wants to make the grain size finer, I'm not aware that anyone has put a material in that condition and then looked for that, because it's not easy to do. It's hard to make an overfull condition. Um, but if you did, what would you see? So you, you have it exactly right. There should be an interface instability. I should get serration and waves, and or I should see the topological, in grain growth, the topological you know, crux point is where a, grain, a small grain shrinks and then is gone. And, uh, and what we need to see is that be reversed and undone. And so, no, I have never seen that. I don't simulate things kinetically. So, I, so I've never probed it. I think this is a huge frontier area to study how kinetics and kinematics of atomic motion can, can look for that point. I think in reality what happens is if you are in an overfull condition, atoms can do other things. They can pop out other phases. I think they find other kinematic pathways to low energy states. I think second phases are going to pop out. If I ever see shrinking grains, I'm going to put in my application for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, talking about the uh, overfill, I've been thinking about that, and there's a lot of literature on mechanical alloying. I'm wondering if yeah. some of that data would be close to this overfilling. Uh, so everything I showed you here in this powder talk, it's all mechanical alloying, right? So I, I start with pure metals and I mill them together and I uh, mechanically alloy them, and indeed they are over full in the sense that they are fully supersaturated solid solutions in the bulk. Uh, but, I, but the overfull condition I'm describing here is one where the grain boundaries are saturated and then, and you're at the equilibrium grain size and you have solute in the bulk as well. So mechanical alloying is so randomizing that it's just solution everywhere. What I need is the condition where the grain boundaries are decorated and there's solute in the, in the grains, right? And that would drive grain shrinkage. So that specific configuration, I don't think mechani me mechanical alloying produces it. I think it produces the higher energy configuration of a total wash, yeah. I think. But yeah, I mean, it's probably worth thinking more about it. I have a question. With all of the metal elements out there, could you take a couple more minutes talking about how you manage to find the combinations of mm. base metal and alloying element? Because uh, it would seem like there could be many more pairs lurking out there that might be amenable to this approach. There are. And in fact, I've published a paper where we list them all. So th there's a giant list that I encourage you to go try. So what we basically do is, so I showed you these maps. On one axis is bulk thermodynamics. That's all, uh, that's all you get it right out of the phase diagrams. You pull it right out of the ASM. The, so the bulk is known. The part that's really unknown is the vertical axes on those maps. It's the grain boundary thermodynamics, an alloying element at grain boundaries, average general grain boundaries. This is not well populated. And so the way you fill that database, uh, so we do it a lot of ways. We collect every DFT data point known to humankind. We put them together. Um, we use Mietema type models, so structural models that are sort of based on a relaxation at the grain boundary. And we calculate that for every known binary pair. And we sort of just put it all on the maps. And sometimes the error bar on those points is, is huge. Mm -hmm. Humankind does not have a good set of data on that. So if you're looking for something to work on and you know it'll be useful, that grain boundary thermodynamic mixing data are sparse. But that is what we do, and we've published all our best estimates for every binary pair for which we can imagine data, and they're all out there. And so of the two terms in your Gibbs free energy expression, it, it's the delta H segregation. That's, that's the mystery. That's the mystery. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yes, Mosa. So what do you think of ad manufacturing technologies in generating nanostructure kind of yep. uh, systems? which is uh, having super fast cooling rates. Right? So if you're talking about an additive manufacturing system in which you melt and resolidify, I'm out. <laughs> because I've gone to great lengths to um, make a nanostructure that is a, you know, it's unusual and it's sort of carefully crafted. And when you melt, you erase all that. And then when it re-solidifies, it will never kinematically find it again. When you solidify, of course, you, you have 
in an alloy, you've got not a melting point, but a, a range. You're going to get macro segregation. You're going to get pushing of solute around. You're going to get a solidification structure out. It will not look anything like this. So if there's a melting process involved, I'm not yet brave enough to go anywhere near that. However, if you're going to do green body printing and sintering, I'm in. And in fact, we're doing that now. So there's lots of ways that you can 3D print a green body in powder and then sinter it to full density. So we are, in fact, doing that. So we're printing you know, lots of different kinds of shapes. Then you fire those in the furnace. And now you have a nanocrystalline, really highly performing alloy in a 3D printed shape. So I have high hopes for that. Yes, Kevin. You didn't mention anything about um, the cost of uh, tungsten carbide compared to tungsten alloy materials. Could you give us a description on that? So if you do a bottom-up cost model, it turns out to be um, remarkably viable to do this kind of approach because milling of powder, part pressing of powder, and sintering of powder are unit processes for which there's a lot of data, and we're not doing anything especially unusual. So we're, this is sort of a drop-in for an existing industry. Um, what's new is the alloy science and the particular recipe. So it actually fits in at a reasonable parity cost with what people are doing today. I think there's room for enhancements in the process because I can change the sintering temperature now in ways that weren't possible before. So actually we're sintering tungsten at lower temperatures than our normal. So there may be process advantages that are even, even better for cost. But at the moment I see no reason to be pessimistic about the cost proposition, especially if the performance is premium. So I, I, I'm hopeful it's going to go, but knock on wood. We'll see. Yeah, um, it seems there are uh, some other scientists are focusing on the stabilization of the nanocrystal. Uh, so some of them use a mechanical, like a SMAP. It's a surface uh, mechanically attrition a treatment. Uh, and that recently, uh, last year, 2016, and some scientists make uh, the bullet. Uh, they, uh, the, uh, they, they actually they shoot that bullet on something, and they found um, at the very top surface uh, there is a nano uh, crystallized uh, part, and uh, there is a gradient. So <laughs> uh, this side is also uh, stable at uh, different temperature. So do you have some comment on this work, like a uh, whole mechanically without anything, uh, like chemical work, like what you did? So do you have some comment about the mechanically? Uh, stay, stabilize the uh, material. So mechanically refining, that, that's kind of what I'm talking about, right? So anything where you put in a lot of strain and, and use that strain energy to make defect structure. Yeah, that, that, so an impact, whether it's a bullet or a ball milling ball or anything, that, that, is, that is certainly a viable way of putting in a lot of strain and building a nanostructure. I don't have any reason a priori to know why that would be stable. Um, so without knowing more, I would say if it's just a pure metal, it probably would not be stable. You have to do something in order to stabilize it. But I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know the particular work you're talking about. So, yeah. OK, a couple more questions. And then Glenn in the back. Go ahead, sure. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I saw that your simulations matches your experimental data perfectly. And I wouldn't say perfectly, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> involves some parameters regarding kinetics, but basically it's thermodynamics. Yeah, the, I don't do anything kinetic, yeah. So that means your um, experimental data you get is basically um, the thermodynamics plays a major role, and the kinetics is not that important. That, that is the way that I, I would... It, you know, when, when I'm in my most optimistic mood, that's, that's the way I would like to be able to interpret it. What I want to say is that thermodynamics is really heavily at play in everything we see here. And so everything you just said is, is sort of right. What we try to do is we put it in a condition where if you do a kinetic calculation, you sort of convince yourself that this thing could move a lot more than it is. And, and then you do a thermodynamic simulation, and when it kind of matches what you see, the tempting interpretation is that it is that way because it wants to be that way thermodynamically. So that, that is what I would love to be able to say. Yeah. <laughs> 
So previously you have mentioned that you were trying to get away from processing chromium for environmental health and safety reasons. Yep. And now you're putting chromium back into the alloy as yep. a material in the alloy. How does that compare for the environmental and health and safety reasons? Good question. So, it, in fact, they're completely separable. So chromium, chromium metal is not a hazard. Chromium metal is very safe. You eat it off, it off it every day, right? It's all around us. It's, it, it, it's a very important metal in our lives. It's not the chromium that's threatening. In, the, in chrome coatings, it's the chemical precursor, right? So it's the, the goo in the bath that is the dangerous stuff. Once the metal is rendered, it's very, very safe. And in this case, I'm not dealing with the, the chemical bath at all. It's just the chromium metal. So those are completely separable. Apart from the word chromium, you can mentally t take those apart. Yeah. OK. And Let's thank Professor Shu one more time. Thanks, guys. I think this is a good time for some final words. <laughs> okay. At the end of your talk, Chris, you said you did it, or you've done it. But I really think you've done it. <laughs> and uh, what you've done is you've delivered three excellent lectures here for us that were exciting from the first to the last minute, involving everyone, our faculty, our postdocs, our graduate students, and our under, undergraduate students, all of who posed questions to you, which is not always the case. And so we are really indebted to you for these beautiful lectures, and also for the very good discussions we had with you and our research groups if there was anything like an ideal Van Horn Lecturer Award, I would hand it over <laughs> to now. But all I can do right now is shake your hand and say, please stay in touch with us. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you again. so much. Thank you.